Happy Monday, Discovery Learners! It is I, Teacher Liz, here with another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. Today, I'll be sharing with you some cool observances, interesting history, cool facts, cool animals, and plants. And let's not forget, there's a new Spanish word to learn and a new place to explore this week. And also, don't forget to log in every day to the live Zoom sessions provided every day by the Discovery Educational Team. Now let's not delay any further. Let's start the show. And now for today's observances. Happy Monday, Discovery Learners! It is I, Teacher Liz, bringing you today's episode of Ability to Learn on Monday, December 27, 2021. Oh boy, only a few days left of this year. And the best way to count down the last few days of December is with this observance, National Fruitcake Day. Across the United States, fruitcake lovers young and old commemorate National Fruitcake Day each year on December 27th. Made with chopped candy or dried fruit, nuts and spices, and sometimes soaked in spirits. Fruitcake has been a holiday gift-giving tradition for many, many years. Dating back to ancient Rome, one of the earliest known recipes lists pomegranate seeds, pine nuts, and raisins mixed into a barley mash. Records indicate that in the Middle Ages, makers added honey, spices, and preserved fruits. Recipes for fruitcakes vary from country to country, depending on available ingredients and tradition. In the 16th century, two achievements happened to make fruitcakes more affordable and accessible. The first one was sugar in the American colonies became more abundant. Second, it was discovered that high concentrations of sugar could preserve fruit. These two actions resulted in excess candied fruit. Consequently, fruitcake making grew. Here are some interesting facts about fruitcake. Typically, Americans produce fruitcakes abutting in fruit and nuts. In America, mail-order fruitcake began in 1913. Charities often sell commercial fruitcakes from catalogs as a fundraising event. And in 1935, the expression, nutty as a fruitcake, was coined. The phrase came about as a result of excess nuts in southern bakeries added to their fruitcakes due to their access to cheap nuts. Most mass-produced fruitcakes in America are alcohol-free. Some traditional recipes include liqueurs or brandy. Bakers then complete the fruitcake by covering it with powdered sugar. Some fruitcake makers soak their fruitcakes in brandy-soaked linens, believing that the cakes improve with age. And did you know that fruitcake has a very long shelf life? It can last for up to five years or longer. But there's a catch. The fruitcake must contain alcohol in order for it to last a long time. Fruitcakes without alcohol included will last about six months. Pretty interesting, huh? So how do we observe National Fruitcake Day? Well, that's easy. Try eating some fruitcake today. Do you like fruitcake? Do you have a special fruitcake recipe? Go ahead and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Candy Cane Day. Now this observance was actually observed yesterday, December 26th, but why not observe it today? I mean, candy canes kind of make the season. <laughs> National Candy Cane Day on December 26th, which was yesterday, gives candy cane lovers a day to celebrate the red and white striped candies found abundantly during the holiday season. In 1844, a recipe for a straight peppermint candy stick, which was white with colored stripes, was published. However, some stories tell of all-white candy sticks in much earlier times. Folklore tells the origin of the candy cane, yet no documented proof of its real beginning. Literature begins mentioning the cane of candy in 1866, and it was first known to be mentioned in a connection with Christmas in 1874. As early as 1882, candy canes have been hung on Christmas trees. So how do we observe National Candy Cane Day? Enjoy one from your stocking or pluck one off the tree. You could share a candy cane with your sweetheart, neighbor, or child in your life. So do you like candy canes? And if you do, what's your favorite flavor? 
I know a lot of candy canes don't taste like peppermint at all. Some of them even taste like chocolate. So what are some of your favorites? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. And our last observance for today is actually another one from yesterday, but I think it's very important to do every day. It's National Thank You Note Day. National Thank You Note Day on December 26th, which was yesterday, recognized the time-honored tradition of thanking people for their gifts, hospitality, and generosity. It is a day to get some note cards, paper, pens, envelopes, and stamps to write those special thank yous. Taking the time to thank a family and friends with personalized messages has special meaning. The receiver of the thank you card will enjoy getting the card in the mail and the message you have written. Personal messages also convey to friends and family a deeper, more intimate sentiment. These handwritten notes, however brief, carry a tactile expression of thanks and that verbal communication often lacks. Never underestimate the power of saying thank you. So how do you observe thank you note day? Try writing a thank you note. Well, writing a thank you note has become a bit of a lost art. So here are a few tips to help you along the way. Begin your thank you by acknowledging the specific gift and how thoughtful it is. If the gift was delivered, then assure the sender it arrives safely and how much you enjoy it. If the giver presented the gift personally, mention something that you remember from your visit. Then thank them for the perfect gift they took the time out to bring by describing it and how ideal it is for you. Close your thank you by gushing about how kind the giver was for remembering you. Within just a few lines, you will find that you have a knack for writing thank you cards. So have you ever written a thank you card? I sure do love receiving them. It does make me feel special. How about you? Have you ever sent one? Or have you ever received one? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. Go ahead and comment down below and let us know how you plan on observing, well, these observances for today. On this day in history. Today, in 1947, the first Howdy Doody show, Puppet Playhouse, was televised on NBC. Howdy Doody is an American children's television program with circus and western frontier themes. It was created and produced by Victor F. Campbell and E. Roger Muir. The telecast on NBC Network in the United States from December 27, 1947 until September 24, 1960. It was a pioneer in children's television programming and set the pattern for many similar shows. One of the first television series produced at NBC in Rockefeller Center in Studio 3A. It's also a pioneer in early color production of NBC, at the time owned by TV maker RCA, used the show in part to sell color television sets in the 1950s. Buffalo Bob Smith created Howie Duty during his days as a radio announcer on WNBC. At the time, Howie Duty was only a voice Smith performed on the radio. When Smith made an appearance on NBC's television program Puppet Playhouse on December 27, 1947, the reception for the character was great enough to begin a demand for a visual character for television. Frank Paris, a puppeteer whose puppets appeared on the program, was asked to create a Howdy Doody puppet. As both the character and television program grew in popularity, demand for Howdy Doody related merchandise began to surface. By 1948, toy makers and department stores has been approached and requested for Howdy Doody dolls and similar items. Macy's department store contacted Frank Paris, the creator of the puppet, to ask for the rights of the Howdy Doody doll. However, while Paris had created the puppet, Bob Smith owned the rights to the character. The red-headed Howdy Marionette on the original show was operated with 11 strings, two heads, one mouth, one eye two shoulders, one back, and two hands and two knees. Three strings were added when the show returned, two elbows and one nose. The original marionette now resides at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Go ahead and leave a comment below and let us know what you think of today's historical events. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure born today is Bill Goldberg. 
born December 27, 1966 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This American WWE professional wrestler who was first an NFL football player, a former WCW heavyweight champion, and world heavyweight champion. Before he was famous, he played college football at the University of Georgia and spent several seasons in the NFL. He later on to become famously known as the Jewish wrestler. He turns 55 years old today. Happy birthday, Bill Goldberg. Our next notable figure born today is another wrestler. It's China. Born December 27, 1970 in Rochester, New York. This American wrestler was born Joan Marie Lauer. She is a former WWE diva who was a two-time intercontinental champion during her career. Before she was famous, she earned a degree in Spanish literature from the University of Tampa. But she unfortunately passed away April 20th of 2016 at the age of 45. But another interesting piece of trivia to know about her is she wrestled for New Japan Pro Wrestling Promotion and TNA Wrestling after leaving the WWE. Wow, happy birthday, China! Another notable figure born today is Heather O'Rourke, born December 27, 1975, in Santee, California. This American child actress starred as Carol Ann Freeling in the movie The Poltergeist and its sequels. Before she was famous, she was personally selected by Steven Spielberg for the film Poltergeist. She unfortunately passed away February 1st of 1988 at the age of 12. Oh, it's unfortunate that she passed away so young. Happy birthday, Heather O'Rourke! An additional notable figure born today is Lisa Jacob, born December 27, 1978 in Toronto, Canada. This American actress is remembered for her childhood roles in Independence Day and Mrs. Doubtfire. This actress eventually left the show business to pursue a writing career. Before she was famous, she made her screen debut in the 1985 John Malkovich film, Eleni. She turns 43 years old today. Wow, happy birthday, Lisa Jacob. And our last notable figure born today is Haley Williams, born December 27, 1988, in Meridian, Mississippi. This American pop punk vocalist rose to prominence as the lead vocalist and keyboardist of the alternative group band Paramore whose first two albums went platinum. Before she was famous, she met her bandmates at her new school after she moved from Mississippi to Tennessee. The Factory, a local funk band in her small Tennessee town, was the first group she ever tried out for. She turns 33 years old today. Wow, happy birthday, Haley Williams. Happy birthday, everyone. Come along, Discovery Learners, as we explore a new place of the week. This week, we are traveling to Uruguay. And do you hear that song in the background, Discovery Learners? Well, yes, that's the national anthem of Uruguay. As you go ahead and give that a listen to, let's learn a little more about their flag. This nation's flag consists of five white stripes and four blue stripes arranged horizontally and a white canton bearing a golden sun, the sun of May. Wow, pretty interesting flag you got there, Uruguay. Now let's go ahead and learn a little more about this country. Uruguay is a country located on the southeastern coast of South America. It is actually the second smallest country on the continent. Uruguay is bordered to the west by Argentina and to the north by Brazil and by the Atlantic Ocean to the southeast. The official name of Uruguay is Oriental Republic of Uruguay. Its head of state and government is its president and its capital is Montevideo. Its form of government is the Republic of Two Legislative Houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. 
The official language spoken in Uruguay is Spanish. The most popular religion in Uruguay is Christianity. And the current population of Uruguay is 3,544,000 people. The total area of Uruguay is 74,655 square miles. That's around the same size as the United States of Nebraska. The main monetary unit of Uruguay is the peso. 44 Uruguayan pesos equals 1 US dollar. The main and probably the number one export of Uruguay is beef. And this country is actually one of the largest exporters of beef. Other exports include vegetables, dairy products, chemicals, and rice. Wow, Uruguay sounds really interesting, and I can't wait to teach you more about it. So be sure you stay tuned to Ability to Learn as we go over more about Uruguay. Wow, now that's a really interesting place of the week. Here is the animal of the day. Here's Andrew Lancaster with today's animal, the penguin. Penguins are flightless birds. Instead of having regular wings, penguins have flippers. There are less than 20 known species of penguins, and they all live in the southern hemisphere. Besides in Antarctica, they can be found in South America, South Africa, New Zealand, and many Pacific islands. Penguins are very adaptable birds which is why they can be seen in numerous zoos around the world and SeaWorld as well. Galapagos penguins are the only type of penguin that can be seen in the Northern Hemisphere. It happens rarely and only when food is scarce in the Southern Hemisphere. Penguins are excellent swimmers. They can swim 15 to 20 miles per hour and they can hold their breath for 20 minutes and they can dive deeper than any other bird. A penguin's eyesight sees better underwater than when it's on the ground. Their excellent eyesight helps them find food and avoid predators when they're in the water. The natural predators of penguins are orcas, seals, sharks, and snakes. Penguins are carnivores. They eat shrimp, krill, squids, and fish. Penguins are social animals. They live in large communities composed of thousands to ten thousands of couples. The unique color of their feathers provide excellent camouflage in the water. Dark colors, blacks, can be seen from above, and their white tummies make them invisible when contrasted with the sunlight when looking up. Penguins have vocal communication, and they also communicate with head and flipper movements. Emperor and king penguins don't form nests for their eggs. Instead, the female lays one egg and the father takes care of it until it hatches. The father will come and cover an egg with this flap of skin called a brood pouch. The egg must be kept warm for 8 to 10 weeks. During that time, the fathers don't eat and they can lose up to half of its body mass before the chick will hatch. Sadly, if a penguin loses its chick, it can steal a chick from another family. The fairy penguin is the smallest type of penguin and it weighs only 2 pounds. An emperor penguin is the largest penguin and can weigh up to 90 pounds. That's a big old penguin. The yellow-eyed penguin lives near New Zealand and it's one of the rarest species of penguin, and only has about 5,000 birds left in the wild. Out of the 18 species known, five species are endangered. Penguins can live 15 to 20 years, depending upon the species. So what do you think of today's animal? Is it cute? Is it creepy? Go ahead and let us know what you think in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Today's plant is the spruce tree. The spruce is an evergreen tree that's part of the pine family. There are 35 species of spruce today that can be found in temperate and boreal regions of the northern hemisphere. Spruce is mostly cultivated as an ornamental plant or as a source of high quality wood. Most species of spruce grow to the height of 60 to 200 feet. The Sitko spruce is the tallest species of spruce and it can reach 300 feet in height. The spruce tree grows very fast, 6 to 11 inches per season, even though some species can grow up to 60 inches per year. The spruce tree has needle-like leaves that are spirally arranged on the branches. The leaves shed every 4 to 10 years. 
Each spruce tree produces a male and female cone, and these cones are used to help propagate the plants, and they can do so by letting out spores when the wind blows through them, creating more spruce trees. The Wright brothers used wood of the spruce tree for the manufacture of the first aircraft called the Flyer. Wood of the spruce is used in the manufacture of various musical instruments, such as the violin, guitars, mandolins, cellos, pianos, harps, and the wood is also used in the industry of furniture making and ship masts. Some species of spruce are used and cultivated as a source of pulp wood, and that pulp wood is used to make paper. Captain Cook used fresh shoots of the spruce for the manufacture of an alcoholic drink rich in vitamin C. The consumption of this beverage was mandatory among the crew during long voyages to help prevent scurvy, a disorder induced by the lack of vitamin C. Tips of spruce needles are used in the manufacture of spruce tip syrup. Needles can also be boiled in water and consumed in the form of a tea. The leaves and branches of the Sitka spruce tree are used in the manufacture of spruce beer. The resin and oils extracted from the bark of the spruce tree are ingredients in various ointments and are used in the treatment of rheumatism and muscle ache and poor blood circulation. Native Americans use gummy resin that leaks from injured spruce trees to help ease their thirst. Some species such as the Norway spruce and Siberian spruce are used as Christmas trees. A spruce tree can survive a few thousand years in the wild, but in Sweden there's a spruce tree that's already 9,550 years old, and it might be the oldest tree on the planet. That's super cool. It's that time again. We just learned about a new plant. So go ahead and tell us what you think in the comment section below. The word of the day. Today's word is bewilderment. It is spelled B-E-W-I-L-D-E-R-M-E-N-T. It's a noun. It means a feeling of being perplexed and confused. Bewilderment. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. That word is tactile. It's an adjective. It means of or connected with the sense of touch. Designed to be perceived by touch. Tactile. Hola Discovery Learners, so yo, tu maestra Liz. Hi Discovery Learners, it is I, your teacher Liz. Aquí es tu palabra en español de la semana. What that means is, here is your Spanish word of the week. Su palabra para esta semana es... Año. 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 Which means... Year. Año. Year. Año. Year. You can use this word in a phrase. Feliz Año Nuevo. Feliz Año Nuevo. Feliz Año Nuevo. Which means Happy New Year. Feliz Año Nuevo. Happy New Year. Feliz Año Nuevo. So go ahead and practice speaking Spanish all week long to get ready for Feliz Año Nuevo, which means Happy New Year. Como se dice year in Espanol? How do you say year in Spanish? Año. Si, sí, muy bien. Hasta luego, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday as we learn a new Spanish word of the week here on Ability to Learn. Hey, Discovery Learners, it's me, Andrew Lancaster here, helping you ring in the new year with some fun movies to watch this week. Our first film is While You Were Sleeping. This 1995 rom-com has a rating of PG, 
and a 1 hour and 43 minute runtime. It stars Bill Pullman and Sandra Bullock, and you can watch it on Tubi. Our next film is An American in Paris. This 1951 classic has a 1 hour and 54 minute runtime and stars the great Gene Kelly and Leslie Caron and is available on Amazon Prime Video. Our next film recommendation is a classic you may already know, Happy New Year, Charlie Brown. This 1986 animated classic has a rating of G and a 24 minute runtime. Chad Allen voices Charlie Brown, Jerry Miller voices Linus, and Bill Melendez as Snoopy. You can find it on Apple TV. This week's New Year's cinematic work of art is Ghostbusters 2. This 1989 classic has a rating of PG and a 1 hour and 48 minute runtime. It stars Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, and the great late Harold Ramis. It was also written by Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd and was directed by Ivan Reitman. You can find it on Sling TV. Ghostbusters 2. What better way to ring in the new year than with a classic film such as this? This movie still gives me goosebumps. From its terrifying villain to its hilarious ensemble cast, this film has it all. It has familiar and energetic theme, the Ghostbusters, and a score that drives the story and the Statue of Liberty. In this film, they stepped their game up with computer graphics that were used to enhance the puppetry, matte paintings, and animatronics that were used to bring the ghosts to life. Dennis Murin, the man responsible for the makeup and special effects of Back to the Future, is responsible for these incredible feats. What would be a better way to end this year and start a new one than lifting your love just a little bit higher with this cinematic work of art? Now playing at the Discovery Theater this Friday, starting at 1 p.m. Aww, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Don't forget to click like, subscribe, or to hit that bell icon so you'll be notified about all the fun we're having at Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time.